Okay, take two of Linux EP44, we hope. <laughs> As we can have a little bit of glitch free, we, we hope, we hope, we hope. <laughs> That's like, I, ironically, I wish everything we were just talking about today then was like, what were we talking about? We were talking about, you know, Fedora, son, like, you think you're going to switch over to Fedora, you said, or? No, 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 I just uh, was looking at the uh, the features that come with Fedora 15. Right. One of the key features is the updated desktop, which in this case, the default is going to be GNOME 3 uh, and GNOME Shell. Uh, I've been using it for a couple of days at work, and even though it's still currently in the alpha beta state, it just hits beta right after you update. It's a lot better than I anticipated. Okay. The GNOME Shell portion of it. Cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it will be nice if all yeah. of that stuff, you know, gets better. It, it, it's, you know, like yeah, you were well, I'm hoping by the time April and May roll around and uh, Ubuntu and Fedora release that they will actually become fully usable and useful environments. I saw earlier, just uh, actually a few minutes ago, on OMG Ubuntu, a bunch of stuff about a newer version of Unity that, like, has a resizable launcher now because so many people complained that it was too big. Customization is key. That's the one thing I've been saying all along. If you don't let your user customize it... Yeah, I'm going to say, all. here's the thing, no matter what you pick, 9 out of 10 people are going to go, that's not right! <laughs> yeah, they're going to say, that, that bar isn't the right shade. I need that to be this much different. Or, yeah. <laughs> I don't like where that is. You need to move that over here. Yeah, it's like, well, if you just let I'm them just, do that, the they're all happy, damn it. <laughs> that's just, uh, I, I, I still think that's one of the big mistakes in the new GNOME, but that's... Um, it, yeah, but it's, it seems to be really locked down so far. Uh, I'm finding more and more of the settings, but still, uh, if you have to dig into GCOMP to do any sort of actual configuration, yeah. Yeah, it... it uh, if it's more than like two sub menus to get to cut to basic end user customization, for the, it's like fail. I don't care if it. Oh well, we buried it under this sub 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 setting in this obscure thing you'll never look in, but it's there. And a lot of the settings so far appear to be you click on the the, lot, the user menu in the upper right corner, you go to system settings, and everything you want is the in there. It's the GNOME Control Center. Uh, however, they've removed things like. Screensaver, and uh, I don't know what else. There, there used to be a lot more things in there, and there's only about ten or twelve now. Either they've gotten rid of them, or they've put them somewhere else. Screensaver was removed entirely, at least in my experience. It's in the Fedora 15 Alpha, and as soon as you update, it goes away. Didn't work anyway. Oh, I guess yeah. that's one solution. If it doesn't work, remove it. <laughs> yeah. But okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, so what was the other thing we were talking about before the lovely recording crashed? Oh yeah, that Linux is not targeted and pwned to own. And it, it, right. sh it, it definitely should be, for no other reason than to make it apparent that <laughs> Linux should be secured, not just assumed it isn't going to be attacked because it's Linux. <laughs> Uh, you know what? Do they only care about end user systems or overall market share in that? Because you're saying it has something to do with mark perceived market share, or I would say I think it has to do with end user system. Okay. Yeah, I just I, I saw the story come up, and I haven't had a chance to read through all of it yet. I just like read the the abstract of it, and it was something to the effect of uh, the people behind own to own say Linux just isn't up to the importance level to get in. And a lot of the suggestions from the commenters were uh, Mark Shuttleworth needs to throw $10,000 at this and get Linux into the, co the uh, competition. Yeah, I mean, it should be attacked. It's, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the more people we've got looking at it and attacking it, the more... Well, the and, and one of the benefits of both Linux and uh, FreeBSD is that, you know, as soon as somebody gets in, you're like, Okay, we're gonna go look at the source code of that thing you exploited right the fuck now and see where our vulnerability is. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> as opposed right, and maybe that's part of the reason why I don't know. I, I don't want to say that, but maybe that's part of the reason they're avoiding it for the pwn to own thing, where everything's open or a lot of things are open source. It'll be a whole lot easier to find the holes. They would think. I, I don't say that's necessarily true, but it, it's a possibility. If you've got the code, theoretically, you should be able to go through and find the bugs. The 
flaw there, and the flaw is a good flaw. If there is a bug, you help us fix it. <laughs> Yeah, I, must say, I, I, I thought the whole point of Pawn to Own wasn't to be creating the next generation of elite black hats, but yeah. to basically be going, here are vulnerabilities that you've overlooked. Fix them! Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't really matter if it's open or not, or, or whatever. See, the news coming out of it always comes down to distro X, whatever, whatever it is, took this long to get into, where this other thing took this long to get into. Ha ha ha. That's just what I've always heard coming out of it. Nice. Oh, XP well, only took 12 seconds to get into. Ha ha ha. It's well, and, and the, the problem I've always had with those competitions in general and, and things is that they make certain assumptions, and that is obviously the more user friendly a system is out of the box, the easier it's going to be to crack into. Yeah. Because part of being user friendly is you don't have to get in a fight with your security settings. To start doing anything out of the box, of course, the end result, all the doors are open. You know, it's the philosophy of, well, should I have to go lock them, or should I have to go, you know, go get a key for every single thing I want to do? <laughs> it's like I, I, I personally would rather put the locks in myself and lock them, but that's me. That's yeah, different preferences. Anyways, moving on to something actually Linux related. It's yeah. like recovering what we were doing for. Um, uh, okay, we were talking about the idea of, and, and as I said before the recording got fucked up, uh, it hadn't occurred to me, but potentially it is, uh, that we may already have a universal cross-platform installer in the form of Adobe Air apps. And you were going, yeah, no, like, I forget what... I, I haven't spent enough time looking at Adobe apps. I'm actually on the, the Air marketplace right now looking at it just to see. Uh, when the staff picks are iPoker, uh, Break It, Mini Clip Games, it says a lot. Well, no, well, and Air is really, really new. You know, yeah. there, there isn't a lot of stuff being... I don't know, Air, Air's been out several years now. It, it's been out years, but what I mean is it hasn't attracted a lot of developers. But right. there is no reason you couldn't write something like Microsoft Office in Air. Uh, I, you know, just to pull something that would be considered useful out of thin air and then it'd be one version you know fully cross-platform because it's running in the air framework uh, I have mixed feelings about this because it is entirely proprietary in that you, you but what functions are even available is entirely up to Adobe um, and the other problem I have with it is it, it, as soon as I find it, it, there's the ones like the Parker ones but then I find potentially useful air apps. And before, as, as we're sitting here, I find notes sync with Google. But you take notes fast and sync them with Google Docs. Well, the, the, there are some things, uh, useful things, like there's some article spinner uh, apps and there's some get work done apps that are, uh, you know, ebook creators, things like that, written entirely in air. You know, they're, yeah. just, they're just air applications, which are, you know, I would consider useful get work done apps for average end user to low level work. The, uh, the ones that I'm most most familiar with are the Twitter clients, and there are some more in depth clients that are air based, but most of them are here's your Twitter window and your messages and your direct messages. Yeah. So have fun with that. Yeah. Well, but the thing is, on all of those, you know, I don't know about the Twitter ones, but all the ones I've been finding that are, you know, actually get any decent work done of any kind, you know, to even launch the app, they want you to basically register it, and you know, they want you to give an email address. Is that how the Twitter ones work too? You know, the Twitter ones, there's obvious reasons for that, but for an app that's largely doing offline work, you know, I shouldn't have to register it and give my thing, and it, it's very clear that is going to be a thing with a lot of Adobe Air apps, and it's one of those things that it's like, you know, I don't want to give you an email address to spam and a phone number to sell, and that's just, uh, I'm a little funny that way. <laughs> Like, we will send you registration info to the info you provided to make sure you didn't give us fake bullshit. Like, none of your goddamn business. <laughs> it's like, some of those, yeah. <laughs> so. Looking through some of the uh, office and productivity apps now. Uh, Craigslist, Gmail on your desktop. And for Gmail on my desktop, I'd rather just use IMAP and Thunderbird personally. 
<laughs> a lot of people would. <laughs> it works. Anyway, invoice create, a Google Calendar invoice creator. That's interesting. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, going completely off topic here. No, no, no. The, 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 that's that's actually right on topic. It's like, and that's the thing. I'm I'm noticing like in the last six months or so, there started to be less like, oh, yet another Air Twitter app and some actual potentially useful Air apps. And it's one of those things, like, and they are largely cross-platform. So it's one of those, yeah. like, is Air unintentionally going to become a standard for applications? Well, and cross-platform, I think including mobile, right? I, I thought I saw something about it on Android. Uh, it, yes and no, in that it's not official. <laughs> Oh. But it's going. It's one of those things. I'm sure if Air apps become popular, there will be an Air for Android and probably for Phone Seven because anybody who will allow you to run Flash would probably allow you to run Air. Uh, which, you know, then you could potentially uh, buy the same application for your desktop computer, your Android tablet, and your Windows 8 tablet and your WebOS tablet. That, that would be a very interesting world. One app for all form factors. <laughs> there are six paid apps in all the Adobe Air marketplace right now. Yeah. It's very much a fledgling market, but it's one of those things. It Because of that, I'm wondering if people won't take to it. Because unintentionally, what's been created there is a cross-platform marketplace. Yep. Uh, uh, completely unintentionally. I do not think that was the intention, but it's one of those things. If Adobe just decides we're going to create an Air Apps website, you know, unintentionally they've created something that works its way into well, every that's, that's platform. What we got right here. <laughs> I'm on it. Yeah, so it's like it, people will start putting paid Air apps in there. There's not much out there. And, well, and Adobe is one of the companies that supports cross compilers, so it wouldn't. It's not like it'd be hard to export something you made somewhere else into an Air app. Right. So. I'd just be curious how limited the uh, the framework is, what it can actually do. Uh, see, that's because I'm not a developer. I don't really know. I know you are limited purely to the functions that Air supports. So my guess is you're limited very much in the same way you would be for a Flash app. And that if you're trying to do something that somebody hasn't imagined being done yet, good luck. <laughs> it's like... But I've also extracted some Air apps and taken them apart. And it, it looks like you can include some own sub-functions yourself, possibly. So I, it, it, it's interesting. I, I have to talk with somebody who I know who actually does air apps develop on that. Anyways, moving on to talk, since we're clearly not going to have James this week. <laughs> oh wait. Hey, he's here. <laughs> he showed up. <laughs> Didn't call in. <laughs> I love it when people show up and don't just like call in. They know we're doing a show. Hey, where are we? In the Google Doc? Uh, we just finished going over the air stuff. If you'll turn your video on, I'll put you on the thing. <laughs> Alright. Okay, B.